Thank you, Jim. Well, that is our text. Last week, we studied the nature of Scripture, that it's inspired by God, God breathed, and now Paul gives Timothy an exhortation as a result of that, and it's our passage this morning, 2 Timothy 4, verses 1 through 5. I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by His appearing and His kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires and will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. But you, be sober in all things, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. May the Lord bless this reading of His Word and bless our time of study in it. Let's bow together in a word of prayer. It has been said that a man's last words are a window on his heart. They give us insight into his life and what he considered to be important. If that's true, then 2 Timothy 4 is a window on the heart of the Apostle Paul because it contains his last words to Timothy and to the church, certainly the last words that have survived. In verse 2, he gives the short exhortation, preach the word. There's more in this chapter than that, but those three words certainly state Paul's burden to Timothy and the church and follow naturally from the last statement that Paul made in chapter 3. All scripture is inspired by God. It is God's word and profitable for equipping us for every good work. Since that is so, we must proclaim it. We must preach it. That is the business of the church. And that is Paul's charge to Timothy. It is given with urgency and solemnity. The end was coming for Paul. Darkness was closing in on the church. It had fallen to Timothy and his generation to meet the challenge, as it does to every generation, to impress upon Timothy the importance of his charge. Paul makes it in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus. He calls them as his witnesses. Paul was not issuing a command in his own authority, but according to the direction and with the approval of both the Father and the Son of the triune God. And it was a reminder to Timothy that he was ultimately accountable to God, not to men, for the work of the ministry to which he had been called and gifted to do. God was witness to that and Timothy was to be aware of it. Paul's charge was made in God's presence and he, the Lord God, was watching Timothy. That's just as true for us. We've been called by God out of darkness into light, and we are to spread the light and do so knowing that our lives are lived in the presence of God. We don't live in secret. Our lives are lived before God the Father and God the Son, and someday the Father will send the Son back into the world. And it is His return that gives real force to Paul's statement. He will literally come again. He will appear visibly, physically. Literally, it will be an epiphany, epiphania, an appearance in glory and power. He will come as a judge to judge the living and the dead those physically alive when he returns, and those already dead. 
Christians will be judged by Christ. We don't think of it in that term, those terms, but it's true. We have examples of that or statements of that from the Scripture. For example, in Romans 14 and verse 10, Paul wrote, We shall all stand before the judgment seat of God. Christians will. And in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 10, he gives some specific definition to the judgment seat of God. He says, We will all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. He was God the Son, the second person of the Trinity, that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. It won't be a judgment of salvation, but of service. We will all stand before him and, and give an account of our lives. But that will be especially strict for those who have been called to teach. That's a serious responsibility. That's why James, in James chapter 3, verse 1, gives that warning. He says, Let not many of you become teachers, my brethren, knowing that as such we will incur stricter judgment. There's a sobriety that ought to go into making a decision to be a teacher. Well, Timothy had already made that decision. Timothy was already a teacher. And he was to carry out his responsibilities with diligence as one who will give an account, which should give, in, should give incentive to faithful service. The incentive, though, is not all negative. It's also positive. The, the Lord's return is our hope. We will see Him in His glory. And John tells us in John chapter, uh, 1 John 3, verses 1 through 3, that that when we do, when we see Him, we will be transformed. We will be changed. It will be a time of great blessing because He will not only come to judge, but to rule. He will establish His kingdom on the earth and He will reward His people for their service in this life. The things we do in this life count. Later in verse 8, Paul will speak of the crown of righteousness which he will receive in that day. That is a proper incentive for Christian service. Future glories, laying up treasures in heaven, living for what is imperishable. That's not just my encouragement to you. That's the Lord. That's based on His instruction in Matthew chapter 6, verse 20. Lay up treasures in heaven, He says. The things we do in this life are done in that way. They are laying up treasures for us. So this is also very encouraging. But still, it is a sobering statement that the Apostle Paul makes. And based on that, Paul comes to his charge in verse 2. Preach the word. Publicly proclaim it. That's the idea. The word preach was used of ancient heralds men who serve kings and princes by announcing their messages publicly at court or at the games or in the marketplace, wherever it was they went to make this announcement. And they were to give the announcement. They were to give only the message. They weren't to amend it. They weren't to exaggerate it. Just deliver it because it wasn't their message. It was the king's message. And the same is true for the Christian herald. He is to give a clear message, it's to be understood and faithfully delivered. Preach the word and let the word do its work. That's the idea here. It, it will, it will do its work. It is unique, it is God breathed. Paul has said that. It is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. The author of Hebrews said that. Luther understood that. I like this quote. I've given it more than once. If you've heard me preach for very long, you've probably heard me quote Luther on this. But reflecting on the, the diet of worms or worms when he made his great stand for the gospel and wrote, he wrote rather in typical Luther style, the word did it all. 
Had I wished, I might have started a conflagration at Worms, but while I sat still and drank beer with Philip and Amsdorf, God dealt the papacy a mighty blow. The Word did it all. The reformers understood that. It's reflected in, in the first of the five slogans of the Reformation, the first of the five uh, uh, solas, onlys, Scripture alone. It only is our authority for faith and practice, for doctrine and morals. And so the reformers were not only good scholars and men of letters, they were preeminently preachers, all of them. In Zurich, for example, when Ulrich Zwingli was converted, he began preaching Matthew and preached right on through the New Testament with the exception of the book of Revelation. During the week, he preached the Psalms. Calvin preached through books of the Bible, Sunday after Sunday, day after day, week after week. That was true of the Reformed churches. There's an old painting of a Huguenot church that illustrates that. Huguenots were the Protestants of France. It was a, a vibrant church. And many were merchants and most were of the middle class. And the painting titled The Temple of Paradise is a, a picture of a simple church in Lyon. The people are sitting on benches throughout the room. There is even a dog sitting looking up at the pulpit. And that is the focal point of the painting, the pulpit, where the minister is preaching. That was the central feature of a Reformed church. They preached and they taught the Bible because it is through the Word of God that God speaks to us. If we ever hope to see a Reformation again, and I think all of us would love to see a Reformation, a second Reformation throughout this land and across the globe. If we ever hope to see reformation within ourselves, if we hope to see real change in ourselves, then we must take seriously that slogan, Scripture alone. It's our authority. And because it is, if that is true, that the Word does it all, if it is true that it is a sharp and living sword, then this matter of preaching is essential for the church. This is largely where the battle is fought. I think it was Mr. Spurgeon who once referred to the pulpit as the Thermopylae of Christendom. Every schoolboy loves to read about great battles, and Thermopylae was one of the greatest of history. It is a, a narrow mountain pass where a small Greek force led by 300 Spartans held off a vast Persian army for three days before being overwhelmed. The pulpit is that for the church. It's where a, a few men fight the battle every Sunday morning with the invading hordes of the world and the flesh and the devil and the spirit of the age that is constantly trying to press in upon us and transform us and want to overwhelm the church. It's that urgent. It's constant. And it's by preaching the Word that we win the battle. And so we're to be at it. We're to be at it all the time. That's what Paul tells Timothy next. Preach the Word be ready in season and out of season. When it is convenient and when it is not convenient. People who preach cannot do it only when they feel like doing it. Only when it suits them, their situation or their attitude. Only when it's convenient, as Paul says. A man in the ministry must be at it continually. And there are many things that can hinder us and frustrate us in doing that. At times it may be being timid about preaching certain doctrines. And preachers have a way of meandering through a passage where they can avoid what 
might stir up some controversy. That's not what we're to do. We're to preach the word. At other times, it may be laziness. Maybe a person gets tired and, and, and suffers from fatigue. And then, of course, there's always discouragement. But the minister, as Calvin said, must drive himself on. And he is to be at it whether people will listen to him or not. Because there are times, it seems, when there is a greater interest in hearing the Scriptures preached than at other times. There are times when, when the Word of God is, as Paul put it, out of season. Even then, though, the, the preacher is to stay at his post like a good soldier and minister of the Word. Paul explains how that is done in the rest of the verse. First, he gives three elements of preaching. Timothy was to reprove, rebuke, and exhort. So the Scriptures are applied in, in different ways to different people. An old journalist, Peter Dunn, said famously, a newspaper should comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. Well, so should the Scriptures. They will do that if they're taught correctly, if they're taught faithfully. This, of course, can apply to more than, than just preaching and preachers. All of us need to reprove and rebuke and exhort people whenever it is necessary. You need to do that. You're in circumstances where you are with people, if it be your family, your children, or your colleagues at work, or your neighbors, or your friends. Now to do that, it takes wisdom. And to, and to have that wisdom and skill, we need to know the Scriptures. So this applies broadly. He's speaking to one man. He's speaking to Timothy. He's speaking to a particular situation, preaching and a preacher. But all of us, to some extent, are preachers. And we need to know the Word of God. We need to know the Word of God so we can preach to ourselves and encourage ourselves and, and goad ourselves on. And we need to be able to counsel others when the occasion arrives. You need to be equipped to do that. And so we need to know that we reprove and rebuke and exhort. It's not enjoyable, at least the reproving and the rebuking is, and I would say it shouldn't be enjoyable. It's not something we should like to do to correct someone, but it must be done, and sometimes we need to, to personally confront people with correction. Sometimes we need it ourselves. Oftentimes we do. Peter was corrected by Paul in Antioch for his failure of courage and conviction when he compromised the gospel. Don't think Peter thought he was compromising it, but Paul knew he was and rebuked him. You read it in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 11. He needed it, and he received it well. So did Barnabas, for that matter. But often, this will happen from the pulpit. And not because the minister is aiming at a particular problem, but because the Word convicts and the Holy Spirit makes it effective in our lives. I'm not thinking of anybody here in this auditorium in the things that I am saying today. I prepared this sermon some time ago. So if there's an issue today, it's not something I'm thinking about and writing about. But if you're convicted about something, the Spirit of God is doing that. Uh, no preacher can know all of the issues uh, that people in the congregation are dealing with. But the Holy Spirit does. That's why this is a living thing. This book is living. Because the Spirit of God is in it. And He applies this book and applies the, 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 the statements of the Bible precisely to our lives. This is a supernatural experience. It is if we're preaching the Word of God. The Word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. It divides the soul and the spirit. It is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. That's this book right now, that we're listening to and that is being preached. This is why it is so necessary to teach the Word of God. It is truth. And it is what God uses to cause change in us, to correct us. And very importantly, to encourage us. The fact is, Christians get discouraged in life. 
We all have trials that drag on and drag us down. Those reformers that I mentioned, all, all of them struggled. They had issues they had to struggle with. They, they had hard lives. And we all do as we grow in Christ and as we progress. And we have failures. We have fatigue. When Elijah became so discouraged that he wanted to die, God spoke to him. Not in the whirlwind, not in the earthquake, not in the fire, but in a gentle breeze. The Lord wasn't hard on his prophet for his failure. He was encouraging. And so his servants are to be also. We sang this morning at second hymn about God's mercy and how great his mercy is. He is a merciful God and a gentle God, an all-powerful God. And he's gentle with his people, and his servants need to be as well. We need to bear one another's burdens. We need to strengthen the knees that are feeble. And we will be doing that if we are teaching God's word correctly, because God reveals great promises in the scriptures. The scriptures are used in various ways. They're used to refute error. They're used to rebuke those caught in sin. Used to encourage those who are haunted by fear. And exhort us to good deeds and diligent service. This is what we must do. And we must do all of this with great patience, Paul says. People don't change immediately. It's sometimes slow in coming. So we need patience, as God has patience. Helps to remember that, it helps to remember what we are. And we are all dust. And remember that God is sovereign. We can't force results. We might get frustrated with people for not responding as we think they ought to. But remember, we cannot force results. That's the Holy Spirit's responsibility, and He's faithful, and He uses His Word to do that. So proper preaching must be patient. But it must also be intelligent. And we must also, as Paul says here, preach the Word with instruction. Preaching should be doctrinal. The church needs to know the doctrines of the faith. That's what Paul gave the people. That's what Paul preached. We know that in Acts chapter 20, verse 27. He reminded the Ephesian elders of that. He reminded them that he did not fail to teach them the whole purpose of God. The whole counsel of God. All of the great doctrines of the Word of God. That is, is best done, I think, through expository preaching, through going through books of the Bible. You were told before I got up to speak about the history of this church, how it has preached the Word. Men before me did that. That's what I grew up on. That's what I learned. That's what's been the hallmark of this place, preaching through books of the Bible, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, unfolding the, the great themes of the passage, unfolding the, the doctrines of the passage, and then taking the principles of those passages and applying them to our conduct. That's what's important. Eloquence is good and helpful. Emotion has its place, but what is essential is knowledge, truth. The church needs the word proclaimed. One of the great preachers of the 20th century, some would call him the greatest preacher, was Dr. David Martin Lloyd-Jones, preached in London for many years. He wrote a book entitled Preaching and Preachers, and in that book he wrote, the most urgent need of the Christian church today is true preaching. It is obviously the greatest need of the world also. Well, it's the need of the world because... God's word is the word of life. It's the word of salvation, of forgiveness through the sacrifice of Christ. It's the only thing that offers the world hope. And it's the need of the church because, as Paul said, it equips us 
for every good work. It equips us to live the Christian life for the decisions of life, and it prepares us for the problems that are coming. So Paul says to Timothy, he was to give sound instruction, preach the Word, explain it, and apply it. Lloyd-Jones said that is the most urgent need in the Christian church today. It, is, it was the urgent need in Paul's day, and he encouraged Timothy to preach fearlessly because he could foresee a time when there would be widespread indifference and really open opposition to the Scriptures. Verse 3, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires. Sound doctrine can be translated healthy or wholesome doctrine. We've seen that before. We saw it previously in 1 Timothy. It, it gives spiritual health. I think it's a beautiful way to describe sound doctrine. It is healthy, spiritually healthy for us. We need it. We, we thrive on that. This is the, the foundation for a, a sound and stable life. But people find that dull don't they? The doctrines of the Trinity, well, that's hard to think about. Well, it is. It's probably the hardest problem or issue to, that the human mind can take in. That's what J.I. Packer said. I think he's right. Justification by faith, sanctification by grace. They don't capture the interest of a lot of people. That and other issues of doctrine. And so, the time will come, Paul says, when people won't listen to it. Instead, they, they want to have their ears tickled, Paul says. The King James Version describes them as having itching ears. It's a, a figure for curiosity. They, they have a constant curiosity for the sensational, which is like a nagging itch that they want scratched. And so they seek relief from, from teachers, teachers with novel ideas, new ideas, interesting ideas. Not correct ideas, but ideas that satisfy their curiosity. They're not drawn to these people, Paul says. They're active in gaining these people. He says that they accumulate them. Literally, they heap them up. They do this, he says, according to their own desires. Their decisions aren't guided by God's standard, but by some subjective interest, by self-interest and feelings. And, and he's speaking of particular people, especially this is going to be in the last days, but it's, it's, it's true now. And the reality is, it's true of every one of us. We have that within us. We have within us a, the, the natural tendency to go off into something that's, that's different. So it's a warning to us. But the warning is, really, self-guidance is always dangerous. Jeremiah tells us that. Jeremiah wrote that the heart is more deceitful than all else and desperately wicked. That's the human heart. That's your heart. That's my heart naturally. And we still, even as children of God, have this tendency within us. Our heart is, is in need greatly of change, transformation, sanctification. But the heart is deceitful. We need a, the objective standard of God's Word. That which was, is outside of us and to measure ourselves by it. Not by ourselves and not by our desires. The Word of God gives us sound, correct direction. But when people turn away from that to follow their own desires, then they turn aside to myths, Paul says in verse 4. Now this is a prophecy of the future. The time will come, Paul said in verse 3. But it comes to one degree or another in every age. It is consistent with human nature to prefer myths to truth. We see that throughout the Bible. We see that throughout the Old Testament. 
Isaiah wrote about it. He wrote about it in Isaiah 30. He describes the people of Judah as rebellious toward the Lord's instruction. Now this is the people who have been blessed. Judah, Israel, the people of God, blessed above all the nations of the earth. They are the repository of God's revelation of His Word. And yet what do they do? Well, Isaiah writes in chapter 30, verse 10, that they say to the prophets, You must not prophesy to us what is right. Speak to us pleasant words. Prophesy illusions. A generation later, Jeremiah described the same condition. The prophets prophesy falsely, and the priests rule on their own authority, and my people love it so. Why would people love illusions over truth? Well, one reason is, as I said, it's curiosity. They're entertained by such things and, and, and drawn to those who can explain them and explain them well and entertainingly. But also, that's more comfortable. The truth doesn't let us live comfortably. It challenges us. It afflicts the comfortable. It exposes our weakness. It, it exposes our need. And, the the, it, and it requires a response. It requires change. People don't want that. They want to hear pleasant words. Not words that expose them as sinful and lost, in need of the Savior, in need of repentance. Myths don't reveal that. They don't call for repentance. They don't require that we, that we know God and that we worship Him, that we, that we love Him with all of our heart and soul and might. Myths don't convict. They allow people to live comfortably. And so people are drawn to those who teach illusions, who promise happiness and encourage Dreams of health and wealth. Well, many will turn aside to that kind of self-serving stuff. And so in verse 5, Paul advises Timothy on how he was to respond as the crowds turned away. As the audience became indifferent. But you, he writes, be sober in all things. In other words, Timothy... Keep your head. Don't be swayed by what is happening. And the sober person isn't. The sober person isn't intoxicated with notions of popularity or by, be, uh, by, by the latest fads that come along. He, she isn't led about by the prevailing fashions of the day. He's steady. He's firm in the truth. It's what the Word of God gives. It gives stability to a person's life. And Timothy was to have that and exhibit that and act upon that. Even though, though people will not listen to sound teaching, Timothy was to stick with it. Continue methodically instructing people in the Scriptures and in sound doctrine. But to do that, he must endure hardship and remember, Timothy was experiencing that. That's why Paul has written this second letter to him. That's why he wrote the first letter to him. Timothy was discouraged. He was experiencing hardship. And so Paul tells him, this is to be expected. Now, Timothy, endure it. Endure hardship. When he's preaching out of season, when, when biblical instruction is not pop popular, he was to endure that. Endure rejection. And not compromise. But not just endure, he was to be active against the spirit of the age and do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. That's how Paul ends. On that note, Timothy, you've been given a charge. You've been given responsibility. Don't stop. Fulfill your ministry. Verse, verse 5 is a good model for ministers. To, it gives um, good instruction to young men who are thinking about 
going into the ministry. This, this is what is required of you. You are to teach and be sober. Ministers are to be men of the study. You have to spend time alone in the study. The books. They must labor hard over the scriptures so that they accurately handle the word of truth. I can remember Dr. Johnson years ago. A, a true scholar and a great preacher saying you have to sweat over the scriptures. Some things aren't clear. We have to spend time with them and that's what's required of us. But lest you think this is just a, a sermon for budding theologians and aspiring preachers and men considering a seminary education, this is for you as well. This is a, a message for the congregation. First, because this is the kind of ministry that you should desire. This is the apostolic pattern, and you should not settle for anything less. If this pulpit ever goes astray and you begin to notice it's not the Word of God's not being preached, you need to protest. That's not God's desire. His desire is that we preach the Word, and that's what you should seek, and that's what you should demand. But also, all of you have a calling. Every one of you has been gifted. Every one of you is a believer priest. That's one of the great truths that the Reformers rediscovered, that we're all priests. And we all have our responsibilities, which is to live to God's glory and not to our own pleasure. We're to be a blessing to others. And we're to go before the Lord God to the throne of grace. And we're to listen to Him speak to us through His Word. You are not your own, Paul told the Corinthians. You have been bought with a price. And so glorify Him in all that you do, in whatever capacity God has gifted you. You're to, to carry out your Christian responsibilities in the home. You're to carry them out at work and in the school, wherever you are, in the neighborhood. All, uh, all of us will give an account someday of how we lived our lives and how we served the Lord and how we served His people, of how we lived in the world and how we lived before the world and how we lived before the Lord. And so we must all be busy doing the work we have been given. Time is short. When I used to visit Romania with our brother Shaban Constantinescu, I met a man named Michael, an elder in the church where we often taught. He had serious health problems. He had a job, but with the health that he had and the time that he had, he faithfully served the church there in Bucharest, and he would often go out to churches in villages and up in the mountains and teach and encourage the saints. He'd give the gospel to people who were sitting next to him on the train or the bus. He'd pass out tracts. For years, he lived an active life of Christian service in spite of all of the physical difficulties that he had. But eventually, his health so declined that for the last few years that I knew him, he was unable to leave his apartment and, and minister as he had in the past. And it, it greatly frustrated him. But I thought as I visited him, when he had the health and he had the time and he had the opportunities, he used it all well. So that as he came to the end of his life, and he came to this period of forced inactivity, he could rightly say, I fulfilled my ministry. Someday all of us will come to the end. Someday all of us will come to a time when we can't minister. It may come suddenly. It may come with an extended decline of forced inactivity. God is sovereign in these matters but the end will come. We should all make it our business to live for God, to live for His glory and to serve Him while we have time and while we have opportunity because for all of us, time is short. 
Don't turn aside to myths. Be sober. Remain in the Word of God. One of the great myths of our age is that there is no judgment to come. No lake of fire that burns forever. There is. And that is the destiny of all who do not believe in Christ. If you've not believed in Jesus Christ, know that your eternal soul is in peril. You are presently under the wrath of God. And that's not just Dan Duncan speaking. That is the, the Apostle John in John chapter 3, verse 36. But Christ is the way of escape. He's God's Son who became a man, lived a perfect life, and died on the cross as a sacrifice for our sins. He was punished in place of the sinner and all who believe in Him, regardless of who they are. This is how great the mercy of God is. All who believe in Him are saved and saved at that moment of faith and saved forever. So believe in Him. Don't believe your lying heart. Don't believe the modern myths. Believe the ancient truths of God's inerrant word. Trust in Christ and live. And then, by God's grace, devote yourself to the word of God. May God help all of us to do that. Let's end with uh, hymn number 18 in the Songs of Praise book, In Christ Alone. Hymn number 18, and then remain standing for the benediction. By the way, great truths we've just sung. It is a wonderful thing to be able to say no guilt in life, no fear in death. And to know that nothing and no one can pluck us from the hand of our Savior. Thank you for that goodness and grace. Thank you for the gift of faith that brought us life, brought us into union with your Son and our triune God. May we live for you and help us to do that as the only way we can by devoting ourselves to the study and practice of your word. We thank you for it, that great gift of the word of God, the Bible. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.